All right, so welcome everyone to episode 28 of Security Matters with the Coffee Squad. Uh, this week, we've got a special guest, Danny Nichols. We're going to be talking about the importance of training, and we're going to kind of put a little different twist on this, and I'll talk about Danny here in just a minute and introduce him to everybody. So to reiterate our outline for our new listeners out there, we always start with drinks, what we're drinking. We are the Coffee Squad. There's one person on the show that never drinks coffee, so... Uh, everyone can make fun of him here in just a little bit. Uh, then we go into the question of the week, uh, followed by a news article of the week. And then we jump into our topic, which, again, is training and the importance of training. So without any further ado, let's introduce Danny Nichols. Danny's a good buddy of mine, someone I've really looked up to, got to know over these last few years. Um, and we met, honestly, through a nonprofit, uh, Operation Surf, um, and just kind of hit it off um, out there in Southern California and we've always just kind of stayed in contact and, and good friends. Danny is a former uh, pro surfer. I don't know if you're ever former, uh, but a pro surfer. Uh, he uh, coaches uh, some women on the WSL tour, a uh, good mentor, a small business owner or a business owner. I wouldn't know if it's really small, but a business owner um, and just a great All-American and a good human being in general. So we thought it'd be great to have Danny come on and talk about the importance of training uh, from a different aspect, right? From that surfing aspect, uh, what it takes to get your mind right and how uh, to not make training so redundant and kind of boring. And so we'll take his uh, views on that in the surfing aspect and in his general life, and then we'll tie that in with security. I think there's a lot of similarities there. So Danny, I'm sure I missed a few things or a handful of things. So go ahead, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, well, I'm a family man, married, two daughters, um, but yeah, I mean, you, you kind of nailed it. I was fortunate enough to surf professionally, uh, right out of high school and, you know, got married at 25, retired surfing, um, you know, started a, a business when I was 30 and, you know, was fortunate enough to stay in the action sports industry and close to surfing, um, you know, so that kept me close to some of the athletes. It kept me close to the U.S. Open of surfing, um, you know, which, uh, you know, op op eventually, well, it, it opened up a door for me to, you know, coach um, Courtney Conlog, who's, you know, been runner up in, on the Women's World Tour for a few years, and she's fighting for a world title. Um yeah, man. And, and it allowed me to get involved in nonprofit work and teach surfing to veterans. So um, that, I owe everything to surfing for sure. Awesome. I mean, a lot of people talk about taking long walks on the beach, holding hands. Well, let me tell you, Danny and I have had some long walks on the beach. <laughs> for him, they've been a lot longer. We never really held hands. I know there's I did, a few. Hey, I did carry you in that Cornwall up a hill or did you carry me i carried you i fireman <laughs> carried you but danny has carried me numerous times <laughs> numerous times That's uh, right. on the beach you know we've done the piggyback thing yeah um uh, so uh yeah. yeah you know some people say you know like i've held hands and walked on the beach danny and i take that relationship a lot further man uh piggybacks on the beach uh uh when there wasn't a, like a water wheelchair or anything available or just yeah. for for speed so Danny's gotten his workout in, man, lugging my 200 pounds around uh, I, on his back. I don't back. mind seeing you suffer hopping up the beach, but after a while, you only got one good leg. It's worth picking you up and carrying you. Yeah, so, so yeah. Cool. Uh, Will, what are you drinking today? <laughs> well, so in honor Leaned of into our that. Uh, guest. Yeah, so in honor of our guest for California, you know, we are starting a little – later in the day since we're on west coast time here so i'm drinking a modern times cold brewed uh bourbon barrel aged coffee so modern times is out of san diego they're actually a brewery but they do they do other things and i did this like small batch roast of coffee and it's a uh, bourbon barrel aged mexico tazalta something i can't pronounce all that you got to work on your spanish homie yeah yeah no no habla so it has a uh, toffee, honey, and caramel nose, but it's it's really good. I like it. Little hints of the oaky bourbon barrel finish. So. Nice. And Danny, I, I, know you, drinking... I know you're a coffee drinker, Danny, right? 
I am a coffee drinker. I had my cup of coffee this morning at 4.45 um, before I left to go paddle with one of our local firemen and police officers. Um, we are in training mode right now um, because we are doing a 9-11 event tomorrow. So I am hydrating with water to make sure that um, I can be in the front of the pack tomorrow and not be a total dog so i'm yeah. doing water right now <laughs> no one likes a shammer danny no one likes a shammer man hey i'm hosting the event i can't look like a turd yeah. can't be in the back. <laughs> uh, awesome awesome i know you're yeah. drinking some foo-foo water i saw it, jake so what kind of Lacroix are you drinking so yeah. you know like, like i switched from aha uh -huh. Lacroix. yeah so this one is really foo-fooey man but it's delicious, man. It's so good when it hits the lips, man. Let me tell you, it's called lemon cello or cello. I don't know, but it's lemony it's and it's lemon delicious. Cello. Yeah. So, you know, I was doing the ahas and I forget the other Pepsi brand. When I went back to LaCroix, I just think they're, I like the flavor a little bit better. So um, if Pepsi and Coke executives are listening, uh, we just lost that endorsement. Coca-Cola <laughs> does have... A bubbly drink that is really good, and it's Topo Chico. Yeah, so but it has no flavor. But yeah, it does. They've got lime. They've got grapefruit. Huh. So maybe we can get that endorsement for you guys because Topo Chico is really good. Topo Chico is yeah, is, is decent. Seen it. But I haven't had it in their flavored water. So, yeah, I'll have to check that out. I know they just have their sparkling, but now I'll have to look for Topo Chico. So. <laughs> I haven't even Boom. heard of that, so I'll have to keep an eye out for it. So, Danny, I got a question because you are a, a coffee connoisseur. Now, I, I just want to see, like, at what level you are compared to Will here. So, have you ever had, I'm going to butcher it, but that, like, the muskrat uh, poop coffee? It's the Kappa, Kappa Kaui or Kappa Koi or whatever. You know what I'm talking yeah. about? It's from Africa. These little rodents eat the coffee beans and then... Uh, uh, they pass them out and it's fermented coffee beans and then they brew it and it's supposed to be, a, I guess, a, a delicacy. So is that, is that real? I, I'm not kidding, man. Yeah. Wow. Is it good? Ask Will. I've only had it where they brewed it <laughs> and put it in a beer. The beer was good. I haven't had the actual, I had the, the middle man, you know, their beer was the middle step. So I don't know how it tastes without being brewed in the beer process, but the beer was good. So. Yeah. Yeah, I'm a I'm a black coffee drinker. Um, if I can if I can grind the beans and espresso it into an americano, call it a day. Um, strong is good. Mm. Do you have a favorite brand? I don't. I mean, I don't know. I mean, believe it or not, Black Rifle Coffee actually has pretty yep. darn good coffee. Um, a lot of the stuff that we get out here that I think just my wife and I always get Stump Town. Um, Stumptown's pretty good. Um, and then, like, if we go to Mother's or Whole Foods, we'll get, like, that, like, I don't even know. It's, like, organic rainforest, mm -hmm. Arabic, whatever it's called, beans. Um, it's kind of like a medium full roast. Yeah. It's good when it's done in an Americano and you just drink it black. One cup will kind of <laughs> set you good. Just enough, yeah. Nice. Nice, nice. Will, what crazy question you got for us this week, man? All right. Well, since we do have a pro surfer and a, I don't know what you call yourself, Jake, a, uh, a Grom. A Grom. Okay. What's your uh, favorite surf movie? Come oh. on, Danny. Wow. I can go first if you want. Yeah, go ahead. So my favorite surf movie, I know it's kind of a cheesy one, and you know, but it's called North Shore. I don't know if anyone's ever seen that or not. So growing up in Montana, not knowing, you know, never really going to the ocean and stuff, North Shore is, was like my movie that I like to watch and go, oh, I'd be cool to do, you know. About a kid from Dakota or something. I can't remember where he was from. Arizona. Arizona, that's right, Arizona. <laughs> yep, he was from Arizona, and he went over to Hawaii and – Sur um, learn to surf from Chandler and all this stuff. Yeah, so that was like my go-to surf movie growing hey, up. When the wave breaks here, won't be there. <laughs> yeah. <gonna> <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> Danny, what about you, man? Oh man, I I have no idea, man, because you have you have like the iconic classic Endless Summer. Yep. Mm -hmm. Um, which as a surfer growing up and you know, my first job was sweeping Robert August Shaping Bay when I was twelve years old. I'd ride my bike over there after school and uh, sweep up a shaping bay and mark off hours, get board shaped. Um, you know, that movie's awesome because it, it just, they're pioneering at that stage. Right. Yeah. Um, and then when you kind of go into like Hollywood, you've got, you know, big Wednesday, you know, there's, there's some classics, North shore point break, point um, break, you know, but you know, like rip curl used to, come out with surf videos in like the mid nineties and probably into the early two thousands called the search. And they had a handful of athletes that would go recon out to remote places in Indo or Africa. And, you know, the cinema cinematography was incredible. Tom Curran, you know, those were like classic surf videos that get you fired up. Uh, and then Billabong had, you know, Jack McCoy doing all their cinematography. And so, you know, Green yeah. Iguana, Sons of Fun. Uh, I'm going to probably botch a few of them, but the, li the list goes on. And then, you know, Kelly's era, you had the Taylor Steele high performance. You know, every athlete had a section, um, you know, momentum, uh, loose change, um, I don't even, I couldn't, pick, I honestly, I couldn't pick it. But if I did have to pick one from like an inspiration standpoint, um, it would probably be Kelly Slater's uh, Black and White. That was like his coming out in like the early 90s where he was just taking it to another level at that time. Dude, and he's still ripping, man. He's still the best surfer in the world. <laughs> he might not do the airs that some of these athletes are yeah. doing, but. The way that guy is taking care of his body and how mentally and spiritually he is like connected to this earth. Whenever the waves get serious, his level of surfing is still the best in the world, hands down. Yeah. Cool. What about you, Jake? Surf's up, buddy. Oh. You guys all blew penguins? it. You guys all blew it, man. <laughs> like, come on, man. That's not what you told me the other day. No, so uh, you said it was the, definitely the new version of Point Break. Hey, how can you not like Point Break? You I'm know? talking about the remake, or the even the remake. Look, I mean, even the remake. Point Break is just a cheesy movie, you know. Uh, Wait a second. Whoa, whoa, whoa! <laughs> FBI undercover surfing. Johnny Utah. Yeah. Johnny Utah. Utah, <laughs> get me too. <laughs> um, no, we're trying no to so I, I think my uh, favorite one is um, called Step Into the Liquid. Oh, I don't yeah. know if you've ever seen that. They just kind of travel around, uh, look at all these different breaks. So, um, like down in Galveston, Texas, who would have thought like you could surf off the oil tankers and the big barges coming in and out, or uh, surfing the Great Lakes? Um, so, and then all the other different breaks and stuff. So, uh, just kind of the surfing. I guess following around the U.S. was was pretty is one of my favorite ones. So, um, and then you know now with like YouTube and everything else out there, the WSL and Instagram. I mean, nightly you can watch different clips of you know someone just ripping John John or whoever else is out there. You know, uh, just crushing it. So, um, yeah. I mean, I always get my little daily take of just watching someone out there just through usually Instagram through the WSL uh, loop there. So. Yeah, good surf movies, man. I remember going to like skate shops and just you could just sit there and watch them all day long, seem like a snowboard oh, yeah. movie. So and just they make it look so easy and effortless. It's uh, it's maddening. So you know, surfing with Danny and some of the other guys out there, man, uh, they make it look like it's second nature. You know, uh, like it's no big deal. And then you get out there and you try to do it, and you're all over the place and right. eating it, and you can barely paddle out. I mean, I hold on to Danny's legs half the time, and he's my little motorboat paddling out. So, <laughs> hey, you got good center gravity. Center, you got good center gravity. You can grab that rail and do some nice turns. <laughs> yeah, it's that gut sitting right there, you know, <laughs> gives me that little momentum left yeah. and right and push me down. So, so yeah. Uh, 
articles. Let's jump into articles and then uh, let's jump into this topic for the week. So, all right, sounds good. Will, what article uh, you got this week? What I, conspiracy I our, theory? No, uh, no conspiracy theory this week. I mean, so Dan the article is read it. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I got one I can talk about if you want. It's a so this is a Yemen says that they uh, hit an important target in Saudi capital with a uh, explosive laden drone and ballistic missiles. So, and also, of course, Saudi Arabia is saying, no, it didn't happen. We intercepted it. But, you know, who knows what to believe when you're over there talking with uh, that part of the world. Yeah, I mean, Saudi, I don't know if they still have like the Iron Dome or the Patriot missile site still there uh, that the U.S. military was manning. But, hey, it's a drone, right? Um, drones can be huge like the Reapers, the MQ series, or they can be small little ones. So, um the Houthis and the Yemenis, man, they're definitely getting help from outside sources. Iran, I think, is what oh, I Oh, for sure. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, interesting, right? Just because Saudi's one of the largest oil exporters. But oil also has been dropping, too. Yep. You know, uh, the amount of oil that's been going out. So, yeah, it's uh, good times, crazy times out there. So Crazy everywhere. Yeah. Crazy. So, that leads me to, to some craziness, right? So, uh, Danny is... Uh, out there in Huntington, just south of L.A. County. Um, and when I saw this the other day, like my heart broke a little bit, right? So I'm a big holiday guy. I love the holidays, whether, uh, you know, like 4th of July. It kind of kicks off every year, like 4th of July, right? Like great holiday, and then just kind of gets better than Halloween. My kids love Halloween. And I saw L.A. County um, banned Halloween trick-or-treating for, uh, for – it lasted all of about a day. Before they got kicked back, and now um, they're allowing it, but they say it's not recommended. So, um, yeah, like you know, we've talked about COVID a ton. I mean, it's brought up nearly every week. Um, I think quite a few of us kind of sit in the middle of COVID's real. Is it as big of a deal as you know the media is making it out to be? Again, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a scientist. I just don't think it is. Um, or the death numbers would be a lot higher than what they really are, and. We'd be taking, I think, the masks, the gloves, everything else would be taken a lot more critically and, and seriously. Um, I'm not saying don't do it, don't wear it, or any of that. That's a personal choice. But, um, yeah, to not have Halloween and celebrate it, that kind of suck as a kid. You know, you think of, you know, kids of, you know, kids are adaptable. We're all adaptable. But to be put through, you know, lack of school, lack of interaction, especially little kids, right? Uh, and now you're taking away. What I would think, I know as a little kid, now my little boys, they love Halloween. Danny, you have kids. I mean, we all have kids on this show right now. And to take Halloween away, I think would suck. Um, and that's like, what's next? Are they going to cancel Christmas? So is, is COVID going to be the Grinch this year? So I don't know what your guys' thoughts are on that. But. Well, it seems to be. I actually saw on the news this morning that L.A., the city, had canceled it. I don't know if it changed or something. Maybe I missed it. They put it back. The news. Yeah. They put it back. Yeah, and so trick or treating is technically an outdoor activity, I mean, and I mean, everyone it's usually wears a mask, anyways. Yeah, so I, I read another article where they're talking about how the hospitals and stuff are running out of the N95 masks. So I, I, the N95 is the only thing that really stops the virus. This other stuff is just I. I I'm gonna behave myself, so you know, but you know how I feel. So. Gotcha, Danny. What's your thoughts, man? Oh man, I'm. I'm pretty opinionated on this topic and, um, you know, yeah, it's a, it's a virus, you know, like the flu, um, and, you know, other viruses. I'm empathetic to those that have been hit harder than others. I mean, I'm empathetic to anybody that's gotten the virus, but I've seen both sides of it. You know, I've got one friend who got hit with it really hard and was, you know, just laid out exactly how they described it in the hospital, you know, ventilation, the whole deal, um, you know, and my other buddy woke up, wasn't feeling good, you know, went and got tested, got the virus, and then woke up the next day and was like, I'm fine. There's nothing wrong with me, but now I got to be quarantined for however many days, you know, so I'm, I think that what we have inside of us is um, 
I don't know, people could take this however they want, but I, I think we have whatever, we have the system inside to fight that. Um, well, it's called natural selection, right? <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's weird. Like you're, the way you breathe, the way you train your diaphragm and the way you operate your system, that your health, you know, all, all that stuff is going to improve your chances of being able to uh, combat any type of virus that you're going to get, right? And the weaker your system is, the more susceptible you're going to be. Um, and genetics will, genetically speaking, you could be more more apt to be affected by it more too. So there's, yeah, I mean, it's, there's it's a lot a, of evolutionary biology that goes into it. It's a really weird deal, you know, and, and I don't know, my wife and I think that we got it in early February. I mean, I know because you it. gave it to me. <laughs> Probably. but we, You know, when I left in March. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, like when we did our, our first responder surf camp, you know, I was, you know, wasn't maybe I was sick, um, you know, but it just it was a weird deal, you know, for a week in February. I got we both got pretty laid out and we're kind of scratching our heads going, man, this doesn't feel like a normal flu, um, you know, but it was gone and over with. Um, I, I just am really bummed that this is where my cons my conspiracy theory head goes to, um, you know, the steps that they're taking to inconvenience us, especially our kids, um, it, I believe is unnecessary and it's causing more psychological harm mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. And nobody's really talking about it, or I should say the mass media is not really painting that picture of the mental effects that it's having on our society, right? So when you weigh out like who's getting the virus versus who's really being affected by the virus, um, I mean, gosh, man, you got, you can go down the list, man, like the isolation, you know, domestic violence, the alcoholism, the drug use, um, you know, the Poor depression. Diet. The, yeah. yeah. The depression that kids are having, the diet, all those yep. things. And after time, the more they get you to do this, it's just humiliating to a, a certain portion of our population, you know, and, and I think that's why people are fighting it back saying, you know, screw the mask. I'm over it. Yep. I'll take the chance. You know, I mean, we talk about America. A lot. I like my freedom. Yep. <laughs> yep. I mean, we talk about the show, right? Like understanding what your assets are, right? Um, and whether that's your personal life, your family's life, your kid's life, your neighbors, whatever that asset is, and then understanding what that risk is, you know, to your, you and yourself. And, you know, if you're in the category of someone who's more susceptible to it, then you probably should stay home and limit your exposure to others. Um, and if you go that's out all so the time. insensitive of you, Jake. What about the other people? <laughs> so I have these talks with my mom. Quite I actually a bit. get that comment from people. I get it from my mom quite a bit. And so it's, you know, at, at what cost, you know, uh, security, we're talking security, right? Um, COVID, the mask, the gloves, the quarantine, everything. It's a measure, a security measure put on by the government trying to keep us safe and secure. Um, but it's a, but it, at it's what a cost, though? Step. It's a half-ass step for, and that's talking. debatable. If if uh, masks works, then why do you have to socially distance? If socially distance works, why do you have to wear masks? I mean, hey, I don't think the masks work because somebody could rip unless a fart it's a ninety-five denim, yep. and you could have a mask on and that <laughs> and still mask, smell it. It goes through the denim. It goes through the mask. Oh, I mean, I've been on many trips with Danny, and I know it doesn't matter <laughs> how many layers between. His butt oh. and my nose. I'm still gonna smell it. So, uh, I mean, yeah. I'm not here to. That's probably I mean, not. That's probably not a lot of layers. To be honest, Jake, let's well, go. you're probably I mean, right down in there. Yeah. Well, uh, mm -hmm. that's that's not that's not the kind of show we're, we're, we're putting on here. Um, <laughs> and I'm not here to debate masks and, and COVID mm -hmm. or uh, anything All like right. that. Uh, I think most of us are in agreement and to what level and to what degree um, it is is it too much? You know, same in security. You can overdo it, right? You can overdo a budget. You can overdo something where it's just not as effective. Um, and again, 
it's it's a new virus. It's something that people are still trying to figure out. My thing is just don't make it political. Um, you know, the CDC came out last week, late last week, saying that the actual deaths related to COVID, like directly related to COVID, are six percent. And people on either side can run and take that number. Um, I think Will we talked about a little bit last week, but you know that six percent, you know, is directly. So not everyone who has prostate cancer is going to die directly of prostate cancer. Prostate cancer, you're gonna, you could die of heart failure, you know, internal fa- organ failure, something else besides mm-hmm. prostate cancer. Prostate cancer just kind of opened that door to those other. Um, elements that came in that you end up dying from. So I just wish the political on both sides would just stop. Like we can't get a direct number. Well, yeah, that's the whole truth. The, the politics yeah. and, and the numbers are, I mean, hell, here it came out, what, a week or so ago that the numbers were all messed up because they were testing, the tests were wrong or yeah. negative, false negatives on this stuff, or false positives on all this stuff. It's hard to give you accurate numbers when the testing isn't accurate. And that's what's going to happen when you're rushing, right? You're in a crisis mode. And we talk about, you know, planning, 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 and you can't always plan for everything. But when a crisis like this happens, you're going to take shortcuts. You're going to try to push it just to put that bandaid on to figure out what's going to happen and how it's going to happen. So I, I feel that's where the government's at, right? They've put a bandaid on. They're trying to do the best they can. Um, but, um I don't know. I don't trust. I don't trust the government. You know, I, I find it interesting now. The media reports COVID cases, positive cases, not deaths anymore. Yeah, well, uh, and well, the cases are going to go way up because we have more people getting tested. Yeah, but they also don't post like the recovery. You know, they're not posting like, oh, this many people got it. And it didn't even affect them. Yeah. You know, like, where's that stat? Because I think that'll start to put everything into perspective of, like, what we're really dealing with here, you know? Yep. Um, yeah. I well, Once they start canceling Easter, they start canceling yeah. Halloween, they try to start canceling Christmas and all these Fourth of July. They go way it, too far. Yeah, It'll be over in about two months. Yeah. I think maybe. We might be talking about something else. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think 2020 is, you know, it's it's like saying 666, man. You just don't want to say 2020 or out because you're yeah. going to get struck by lightning or or something's going to, you know, j- just knock you on your butt. So, um, uh, so yeah, let's okay. jump into this topic. Resilience. Resilience. Yes. So the importance of training. Uh, I, I mentioned earlier on, you know, we have Danny, a, a pro surfer, and I couldn't think of, I mean, I could get some of my buddies and the special operators and talk about training. I could talk about training uh, on the security side, but I – you know, I think Danny's going to bring a different perspective um, of of surfing and to get to that level, the training it took him. And now that he's retired from doing it personally, how he coaches people um, and the training that they're going through and how it's changed, you know, how it changed from when, you know, Danny, you're young in high school doing it to on a professional level and, you know, the different aspects. And then we're going to talk about, you know, tying security into kind of weaving security into those, uh, into his, into his training and how that helped, uh, happened with him surfing and, and coaching now. So Danny, you know, real quickly, what got you into surfing? Uh, well, my mom grew up in Huntington beach and she was, she hung out with all the surfers. Um, she moved away when I was born and I spent the, the first, I basically spent up until third grade living up in the mountains, up in the San Bernardino area. And in fourth grade, she reconnected with all of her surfing buddies in Huntington and moved back. And it was just a really natural thing. I would go down to the beach with them on the weekends. Um, I, I just had a, I was really natural standing up. Uh, when we lived in the mountains, when it would snow, I would always stand up on sleds and, and go down our driveway and go down the hills. Uh, there's pictures of me when I was like three years old, standing on a surfboard in a pool, going from one side to the other. And so um, it, it was always kind of natural. And then in fourth grade, you know, just coming down here, I was a diehard surfer. That's what we did. You know, I grew up longboarding. Um, which I think really helped establish my foundation in surfing because 
it makes you have to rely on the rail of your board and draw your turns out and um, have power, you know, and then, you know, fast forwarding into high school and like surfing the pier every day, right? It's, it's hyper competitive. Um, you got to fight for waves with the other kids that surf really good, the adults that surf really good, um, you know, and so I also had a lot of like dysfunction in my life as far as like my, you know, grounding kind of family life. And so uh, I, looking back on it, surfing was kind of like my my security blanket. It was kind of my place that I could go. Um, you know, I learned a lot about myself in the water because the ocean can bring out the best in you and it can bring out the very worst in you. And through my competitive career, you know, I didn't have the coping skills to be able to like understand what was happening in a 15 to 30 minute heat or how to manage that because my expectations were, you know, I wanted to do really, really well, but I wasn't putting in the work behind. And so when I would get the results that I got, it was, you know, it, it, it was like the end of the world. Right. Um, so I think what kind of teed me up to, I guess, be in a position to be able to, you know, mentor or coach people was all the struggles that I went through and all the really hard lessons that I learned, you know, I, I will unveil a little bit on my story. There was a long period that in there of drugs and alcohol that kind of shut this thing off for a while, you know, and, you know, I, you know, been in recovery for a while and retapping back in with the ocean, a spiritual side and learning from my mistakes it put me in the driver's seat to be able to share a lot of that experience with people that I work with and, you know, really be a sounding board and help them kind of work out, you know, Hey, by the time you get to the event to compete, you're there to just enjoy it. You put in all the hard work, right? So we really have to rewind and, you know, start, you know, whether it's a month before or two months before or whatever, and, and work our way up to that moment. And that process from start until you're, you start competing is mindset, you know, diet, you know, routine, um, you know, all those little things. And then, you know, the ocean, no matter how much you train and prepare and, and you know, count the, the time between sets and understand what the tide's doing and how it's affecting this sandbar, or that sandbar, like you have no control of the ocean, right? So at the end of the day, the only thing you can control is your attitude and your actions, right? So uh, a lot of it is, you know, mind, body, and spirit with working with people because they've got the strength, they've got the talent, and, you know, they deserve to be there and they deserve to win. And so a lot of times it just comes down to like, well, how are we feeling in here, you know, and how are we keeping this and this connected so we're present? Right. And we're not, you know, thinking ahead. Right. Which is anxiety for the most part. Right. When you're you're not present and you're thinking of stuff that's not happening yet. You know, if you're not thinking about that stuff in the right way where you're man, I mean, you, no matter what, you're manifesting it. Right. So you could be feeling what it feels like to win. You could be feeling what it feels like to get <laughs> that right wave and, and to you know, do the turns that you need or whatever, or you could be thinking ahead going, Oh God, I got to surf against that person. Right. Yeah. And then you've kind of, you just unraveled your whole, your chi, you know, your own energy field that is going to tap into that ocean and, you know, ultimately be one. So, I mean, I think, you know, you hit on quite a few points and one of them, you know, is that, that mental preparation, right? And then and the physical pre preparation that goes along with it and the security, you know, it's it's somewhat similar, you know, not exactly the same, uh, two completely different aspects, but, you know, for a security professional, whether you're a security guard, a law enforcement officer, uh, a security consultant, um, on any side of security, we look at 
you know, three things in security. You know, you're looking at the human aspect, you're looking at the physical aspect, and then you're looking at the technical aspect uh, of security. Um, and all three at some point intertwine and connect with each other. Um, and it's the training, you know, it, it's the interest first. You have to have an interest mm -hmm. to get into, into the security industry. And some of us, you know, through military training or law enforcement, you, you kind of fall into it naturally or you get pulled into it. Um, and then I think what separates a true professional than someone that just kind of goes out and does it um, is that that wanting to get better. You know, you, you talk about surfing competitions, you know, and the security, you know, and what I do and what we do here is, you know, that, that security can, uh, consulting is is going there on site and doing those those assessments. Mm -hmm. um, that is the tournament. And then you're writing that report so your client can understand it. And you write it in a way that someone who doesn't even understand security understands, hey, these are your critical points. And, you know, and you kind of break it down that way. So um, uh, that's awesome. What has, I guess, like pro surfing and, and coaching, what has that taught you about training and the importance uh, of training? Well, my philosophy is that we're all energy, right? I mean, this is, this is all energy. Your brain is a transmitter and receiver of energy. Um, you know, your thoughts, I believe, manifest and create your reality, right? And so, like, really taking care of your body Right. So like I believe the foods that you eat, um, the books that you read, you know, your commitment to uh, a spirit. I, I call it a spiritual path. You know, I mean, I know uh, there's people that, you know, follow different religions and there's, there's they get a lot of faith out of that. Um, you know, just that believing in you know, something higher than us. Um, you know, that is a super human power that each of us have. And when you can really connect into that, you can basically build up your vibration to radiate at a much higher level. And through, you know, gratitude, uh, positive affirmation and things like that, uh, it really sets you, it really vibrate, it, you really vibrate on another level that people can feel, right? And the exact opposite is when you have that negative thought, um, you know, the diet is huge. Um, you know, you, 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 you kind of become what you eat in a sense, right? And so your vibration comes back in and it doesn't radiate and it doesn't transmit. Um, I don't know if that totally relates to what you just said. No, so I think it, it does. I mean, so if we break it down into like a cluster, right? You're, you're talking about habits, right? Um, eating habits. Well, same thing in security. You know, do you, do you go off a checklist and, sh you know, just merely go off a checklist that someone handed to you uh, in security when you're doing an assessment or, or anything security related? Or do you use that, that checklist uh, as a habit to make sure, hey, I'm going through everything, but everything's a little different, right? Each wave's Absolutely. a little different. Each yeah. break's a little different. Each surfboard yeah. feels a little different. Um, the water temperature's different, yeah. you know, depending on, on, on where you travel. So it's those habits, right? Um, and performing. I think, you, I think you use those checklists as kind of a roadmap, but mm -hmm. you really have to have your own experience to find out what works for you. Just like I, I, I would probably say like from a security standpoint, like what works for this company might not work for this company. Right. But the roadmap is essentially kind of the same when yep. you go a, a through Z, you know, you just have those experiences in there and you understand yourself and that's how things change a little, right? Like, yeah. like carbohydrates and dates and granola really, affect me in a positive way right you know because the the sugars kind of like chicken get... nuggets and french fries and coke does <laughs> well, for me the, the 
the glucose and, and the sugars and all those types of things actually really benefit the way my brain operates and, yeah. and, and it gives me really sustained energy, but that might not work for the next guy, you know? So you're talking about that variation. Yeah. Everyone has a little bit of a variation. Um, right. But it's still essentially part of that checklist, right? Like it's under yep. diet, right? You know, just like it's under, I guess, you know, your. Well, so diet for us, in my you know, opinion, is like, you know, you could diet. You mentioned books and reading, right? Um, mm-hmm. There's so many great books out there and you should always continue to learn as a security professional because things are constantly changing. Um you know, I'd say things are getting way more high tech now in the security industry. Uh, the principles stay the same. I don't care if you're talking about cybersecurity or physical security. A lot of those principles uh, are very, very similar uh, and the same. The principles are the foundation. They're not going to go away, but you're going to have different variations. You're going to always have to study um, and be ahead of the curve. I know Will and I are both going to the ASIS GSX conference here in a few weeks, you know, and that's kind of the latest and greatest technology out there. And you're going to hear from different speakers in the security industry. Um, and so that's that variation. That's that study. And that's that commitment. I think that you're talking about, you know, yeah. on, on the surfing side. So, well, I don't want to hog up this conversation. Like, please jump in, man. Well, I, I think it's really good points that he's bringing up as far as keep continuous training and, and the habits and, and setting those, those good habits and following those good habits and, you know, breaking those bad habits. I think that's pretty, really, I think that's important in all aspects of life, but especially important when it comes to your security training. So Danny with, with Courtney, um, I know you've been helping Courtney out for a few years now. Um, how do you keep training fresh? How do you (laughs) keep it up to date? And, um, and I know you coach other people as well. So, you know, let's cut, you know, briefly talk about how you keep it fresh and then how do you, how do you change that training schedule pipeline, whatever you want to call it to fit your other yeah, students can, and, and, and right. athletes that you coach. Yeah. So I, I can give you two, I can give you two examples that are on the opposite ends of the spectrum. Right. So to the, Female athletes that I'm working with, um, Courtney Conlog is, you know, one of the best ever in the world. And she's been runner up a few times. She's been so close to winning the world title. She's had some nagging little injuries here and there or just a, a bad break here and there. But she's just entering her prime at 27 years old. And so... You know, she's been on tour for 10 years already and she is, you know, gets considered, gets that veteran label thrown on her every once in a while because she's been on tour. Well, with her, she's just getting stronger and she's getting more in tune with her body and what she needs to be able to stay consistent over you know a 10 month period which is a really long time especially on a world tour because you're going from one country to the next and you've got time zones and you've got rental cars and you've got all these things which you know they're very grateful to have that opportunity but managing you know point a to point b and then with the world tour you've got you know two weeks a two-week window to run an event and you might run one day, be off for four days, run one day, be off a day, you know, run two days, or, or you may just be sitting there until the last day because the waves just never came in and you're, you're just uh, rushing it through. So, you know, she is very, very smart and she's very wise and she has her system dialed. And, you know, I think what worked really well uh, when I got to sit in her corner was, you know, I didn't, I didn't come in saying like, okay, like this is how you're going to win. Right. Like I kind of came in and said, look, like you're the professional here, you know, and you've done all the hard work, you know, I'm going to kind of come at you from a little bit more of a spiritual side and listen. Right. And so, 
it's kind of this sounding board relationship between the two of us because she she's one of the smartest people on tour right and so her head is just constantly going you know working out like plan a plan b plan c plan d and if this you know and then this yep. wave's gonna break third wave in the set's good this one's gonna hit right like she's so sharp and so a lot of times in our pregame routine it's you know let's just kind of go through that motion right and then at the end of it you know i'll reaffirm and just kind of just get her focused on like you know one or two plans right and so giving her the confidence and making her believe in herself that hey like you got it right like trust in the process and believe in yourself because you just put it all together don't worry about all this other stuff trust it and go with it you know and sometimes athletes at that level they just need a, a calm energy in their corner or in a sounding board to kind of help them maybe get some of the other stuff out of the way so they can just be here and be present right and we've had some success with that and you know there's been times where like being in her corner where i kick myself is you know i also relied on that too much to the point where you know when i was kind of feeling something inside like hey maybe you know maybe you need to be a competitor right now maybe you need to go sit on this person maybe you need to show this person like who's the boss here you know or maybe you just need to like I hate to say this, but maybe you just need to kind of walk over to that person so they can feel your presence a little, you know, and screw up their chi a little bit. Like those are those tiny little games that you don't want to play. But sometimes those are those tiny little things that the very experienced do just to kind of get in the heads of their competitors, which can be the difference of a world title. Right. Um, so like with Courtney, she cross trains a lot, you know, and so she is constantly training she's probably one of the strongest women in the world um and you know for her it's it's balancing it out with the spiritual side it's balancing out with quiet time it's balancing it out with you know some meditation some breathing you know because those adrenal glands are used so much that you know between the pineal gland your limbic system you know all that stuff gets it gets tired and they drain, you know? And so if you need to operate at that level, like you've got to pick your times when you want to balance it out to let that stuff kind of like fill back up. So when you have to hit it, boom, you, you match that with the right energy and you're unstoppable, right? Yeah. That's like one side of it. The other side of it is I work with an adaptive athlete um, who has been surfing for a year and her name's Liv Stone and she was going into the world adaptive championships this year in March. And we started working together in January. And what I told her and her family, they said, look, like this is a three year plan. We have zero expectations this year. This year is all about just getting the right equipment under your feet. Let's just get some basic fundamentals down and let's just start setting the mind and the body right to get connected with the ocean right if results happen this year they happen but that's not our goal this year right like we're just going to surf we're going to focus on the fundamentals we're going to get the right equipment you know and she has that same x factor that courtney has which is that like i think elite athletes or maybe operators like people that operate at a higher level they just carry that energy right and so Going into it, you know, we did a couple contests running up to it and, you know, she made the finals, but she was still figuring, you know, she, cause she's a bilateral, um, congenial bilateral, oh man, I'm gonna, I'm gonna botch it. Can't believe I don't know the name of it, but uh, her arms are shorter, you know? And so she doesn't have the ability to push up or paddle the way other people do, you know? And so, when she, she has to get into a wave early and then there's this process of like pushing up here and then getting a knee up and then a foot, right? And so that process could take like five seconds or six seconds, right? And that could be the difference of making the drop in 
and getting a wave or not, you know? And so us spending time this year, getting all that equipment dialed and figuring out how to improve those things was our goal really. And because she believed in herself and she was having so much fun with the process and she was getting on the right equipment, she went into the world adaptive championships believing that she could win right like she believed it uh, which is huge right her energy everything was there she was present for it and she won you know which was incredible because that wasn't the goal this year at all you know that was year two year three you know but she's advancing so fast so a lot of it with with her is going to be balancing the expectations that she has and getting those fundamentals right and then challenging her to uh, progress in certain areas, right? Like when it comes to doing a turn, right? It's like, let's watch that turn over a few times. Okay, your back leg got straight, your balance got off, see how the turn cut there, you know, keeping that back leg bent a little more, leaning into it, opening your shoulders up, you know, letting the hip open up will allow you to flow through it. Like, who cares if you fall? Who cares if you fall? Do that move, right? Get that feeling down because when you do and you pull it off, you're going to set a new reference point there, you know, and that's going to become second nature. Yeah. So, I think it's, uh, you know, interesting. You, you know, you compare Courtney and Liv together, right? Uh, and two opposite ends of the spectrum coming in. You know, Courtney, a professional, Liv coming in and learning – what you said, you know, that foundation and in the security realm, it's the same thing. Whether you're a newbie coming in, you still got to learn those foundations. You got to learn how to make that turn that you're talking about. Right. Um, and what that means. So, you know, in the security world, it's just learning what I would consider like the, the PSP fundamentals of, you know, a security professional, just learning those fundamentals learning what crime prevention through environmental design is, learning about security cameras, alarm systems, um, and just learning the basics. And then as you become a professional, it's just tweaking them, tweaking them yeah. for your client and yeah. then understanding like, hey, what's new out there, um, as we just talked about with, with the GSX. So um, one other thing, you, you know, you mentioned, Danny, and I know you've done a lot of international travel. You and I have traveled over to the UK um, together and, uh, we've had these discussions of like security, right? So with, with Courtney who travels internationally, you know, what, what security concerns and, and what things do you guys talk about as far as countries she goes to? And, um, you know, I guess, you know, travel security, I guess is what I'm getting at. Do you guys ever, you know, do you ever give her bits and pieces or advice that, Hey, like when you were traveling, when you were younger, you screwed this up and Hey, don't do this or that when you're an international country. Yeah, you know, I don't know what Courtney's experience was early on when she started traveling. Um, I know that, you know, she never travels alone. You know, she's usually traveling with, you know, her mom and at least one other person. Um, and the way that the, you know, the, the surf companies like Billabong and Quicksilver and Hurley and Ruka, the way that they're all set up, you know, they have, um, you know, they have people there that are waiting for them. Uh, a lot of the athletes these days travel in a group. Um, they're going from place to place. So, you know, I, I mean, look, on one hand, you know, women traveling around the world is sketchy, you know, and, let, you know, even, even if you've got some big, strong guy there that can mess people up you know it, it, you could be a target for sure um you know but i don't believe that she or any of the other athletes really put themselves in that position you know they're usually with a bunch of people or they're people at the airport waiting for them a lot of times it's local people and so yeah uh, and i'd yeah. imagine like billabong and you know, Rip Curl and all the other O'Neill and all the other major surf brands out there that are putting on these tournaments. Um, you know, a they're they're working with a host country, right, and, and the local um, law enforcement. They're also probably have some type of travel risk management. I don't know that for sure. I haven't. I, I don't know, man. But I will tell you though that there's been stories of athletes 
um, being held at gunpoint coming out of the water in Brazil, getting their surfboard taken, um, hotels getting broken into, you know, stuff like yeah. that. It happens, um, you know, but I don't know, man. I, I don't know. This is where, this is where, you know, I'm not naive to security, but this is where uh, I, I'm pretty hardcore about the connection with the universe, man. These, these people are very positive people. They radiate energy and they're yep. really tapped into the universe. And so I think a lot of times the universe is looking out for them, you know, <laughs> question for you no i mean uh, uh I, I think it's fine you know i i do think uh the way you carry yourself right and the way you mm -hmm. hold yourself um hey and don't kid courtney will kick your ass oh i know she i mean i've met her a few times a she's a badass. beast she is a beast <laughs> a badass i think she's uh, a black belt in one of the martial arts um she will kick your butt so if anybody was to ever try to mess with her good luck yeah. Well, I think I, I think what she's like, you know, traveling in groups and sticking with the people that are supposed to be picking her up and stuff. I think that's kind of like the main things that you would be told as you were going to a foreign country. One thing you brought up a while back, I, I kind of wanted to touch on is as a trainer, I think it's very important that you tailor your training to the person you're training. You know, yeah. you're training Courtney on one level because she already has the fundamentals, so you really don't need to work on that. You might hone something here, but you're teaching her on one level, whereas Liv, you're teaching her the fundamentals. So it's very important as a trainer that you know your what your trainee needs to learn or lacks for a better word in their training and that's what you tailor your training to so i, I think that's yeah. a very important yeah point. i mean will i mean you've uh, you've done the basic security course here for us you know and then we have an advanced course and i know you're also putting together um a webinar for for both of those you know for us for you know there will be free classes and you know we'll be out there for people uh, to take, but it's the same thing, you know, uh, in the security realm, you start the basics and then once you get those understand, th then you push it up. So, um, Danny, I, I know we've had you on here for a little while. I kind of like, I got three quick questions for you. Um, what's your best advice you could give a trainer or a trainee? Let's start with a trainer. Um, and then what's the best advice you could give to a, a trainee or a student? Oh man, I don't know. Um, the way I approach it with you, know, whether it's employees or the way I approach it with, with athletes, it's listen, you know, listen, because our, I believe that our job is just, we're, we're part of the support role, right? We're not the guru. We're not the master, you know, we're not the know-it-all. Um, the second you believe that you are, um, you've lost the ability to listen and really tune in to what it is that they're trying to tell you. And so uh, naturally I, I, I study people, right? Like I study behavior, I study their body language. Uh, I study the, you know, a lot of things. And so once I kind of know who a person is and how they tick, it's really easy to kind of just feed them the information because at the end of the day, they have to have the experience themselves, right? Like I can't have the experience for them. Or I can't do it for them. Therefore, I shouldn't just tell them how it is that they need to do it. All I can do is go through the experience with them and talk about it, right? And, and listen. And, you know, a lot of times yeah. with, with athletes that I've found is it's, it's here, right? Like, yeah, there might be, fundamentals and things to work on that takes time you know give yourself time to do that but if you don't get this thing right you're never going to give yourself the time here to do it because you're always going to say you're a failure you're always going to say you can't do it you're just going to reinforce that bad behavior and never achieve what it is you're trying to achieve right yeah um, i mean so you said a word in there that i can't stand which is can't you know yeah uh, you know when i hear people say i can't it's you're making a choice, you know, um, we can do most things. You just have to learn how to work around them. Hey, if you can conceive it and believe it, you can achieve it. Right. Like yep. the only thing that is stopping you from achieving something is what you're telling yourself, you know, because if you have a burning desire, if you really believe that you're going to achieve it, 
then you're going to be willing to take all that action to achieve it, right? Because you're going to be driven by something that is much bigger than you to accomplish that stuff. You know, you yeah. just have, you have to believe it. Yeah. Great words of advice. I mean, I, I you, whether any type of training. So you you're know. doing the channel crossing in two months, so you better believe it, Jake. I got you, man. I'm just holding on to you, man. Paddle. I got, you know, you're, you're my horse out there, man. Just go, go faster, Danny. Go faster. Uh, no, for sure. Uh, so let's talk about that, right? Uh, we got a few minutes left um, before I know we all have to get going here. Um, you're wearing Operation Open Water hat. Um, you're the founder of it. Uh, we kicked off, you kicked off the first event in March. Um, so for our listeners, they know, you know, Will and I are both veterans. Will was a, a law enforcement officer that got hurt on the job. Um, Will has learned don't step in front of a car at 75 miles an hour. <laughs> Bad stuff happens to you, right? Uh, so, um, in five minutes, Danny, let's 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 talk about open Operation Open Water before we uh, have to shut this thing down here. But tell me about or tell our listeners about Operation Open Water, how it started, what it means to you, and what you have going on. Yeah. So let me see if I can sum this. Let me see if I can just summarize this. So basically, Operation Open Water was uh, an evolution of um, you know myself and others working with veterans at another nonprofit organization, you know, helping, helping teach surfing to our veterans. Um, in Huntington Beach, we have this beautiful relationship with our law enforcement and fire department. And what we saw was that there was this relationship building between our surf community, our veterans and our first responders. And so on Veterans Day last year, we did an awareness paddle to um, address some of the mental health issues that are happening both in, uh, with veterans and with first responders. And that was, you know, really related to the stress over simulation trauma and, and you know, depression and suicide. And so Kyle Kelly, who's a veteran, who's a co-founder of Operation Open Water, he was training in his family's pond in Southeast Texas to do the channel crossing. And so he came over to do the channel crossing on Veterans Day, along with myself, some surfers and some uh, local first responders. And that channel crossing was 32 miles from Catalina to Huntington Beach Pier. It was a mission. It was hard. We accomplished it. And it really was the start of what Operation Open Water is today, because uh, that success really springboarded us into pursuing, you know, uh, becoming a 501c3. And so 2020 has been the year of proof of concepts, right? And, and basically figuring out what programs we want to have in 2021. And so we have um, a first responder surf camp that really bridges the gap with some of our veterans and our, our first responders to surf fellowship and, you know, just relax, let the healing powers of the ocean kind of do its thing. And, We've also incorporated some education into our mental well-being and um, hosted a seminar with Brian McKenzie um, with Art of Breath. We are doing a 9-11 event tomorrow. Um, basically, we Kyle Kelly came down, a couple other veterans came down, some of our local first responders. We're going to honor the numbers of 9-11 and... Um, you know, do something really special to never forget those that paid the ultimate price. Right. And so we've got kind of like a nice little workout thing set up and that's going to be a proof of concept to an annual 9-11 event in Huntington. Uh, and then our channel crossing, which will be our one year anniversary, which is coming up here in November that Jake, you are now doing because part of the mission was, you know, Kyle got mentored across it last year, and now Kyle has to come back and mentor another veteran. And then Jake next year will have to come back and mentor another veteran, and, and it'll just be this this process, right? So, you know, the vision really around Operation Open Water is, you know, to provide a, a brighter future for our nation's heroes. And, you know, our mission is really, you know, to use open water experiences, um, you know, to provide fellowship exercise, 
um, to help strengthen the mind, heal the body, and raise the spirits of our veterans and first responders. And we realized that large bodies of water are the medium to bring us together. And so in addition to oceans, you know, we want to reach out to other communities, um, you know, that have lakes and other opportunities to get on the water and fellowship. And, you know, our, you know, our veterans and first responders can be that olive branch to reach out to these new communities and really pulls together because Jake, well, you, you guys know, man, like when you, when you sit down and you, you talk to another veteran, or if you sit down and you talk with, you know, law enforcement officer or, um, you know, a fireman or a paramedic, you guys can get real with each other real quick. Right. And so I feel like myself as a surfer and some of uh, us kind of waterman type figures, you know, we can bring, um, we can bring a, a different element into that environment to really kind of create a beautiful triangle. And, you know, we can all together promote, you know, mental well being, you know, mental health, um, fellowship, the exercise, accomplishing goals together, uh, positive forms of trauma bonding, if you will. Yep. Uh, you know, and it's, it's pretty exciting, you know, and so we're, we're, we are very passionate about this mission, this opportunity right now, because we've all seen it out there, man. And yeah, there might be some bad seeds, but the majority of our law enforcement officers are good people and they're, they're trying to do a hard job. And if we can be part of this solution and just create opportunities to bring us together. I know, like, you know, as a veteran, like, like you just want to continue being a service, man. Like you signed up to serve your country. Like you're very passionate about, you know, our flag and what our country represents. And, you know, for those that are serving on the front lines in our communities, we can share some experience and help give them a little extra to be able to do their job better because, it's a hard job that they do. And those are the people you want on the front lines because they've got the experience, you know? So let's just, let's lift them up a little bit, you know, yeah, let's, for sure. let's, support, let's support them more and say, you guys are doing a great job here. We just want to be, we just want to be some good energy. That's telling you are doing a great job. And if we can do anything to help you guys perform better on and off the job, killer. We're, yeah. we're, we're serving our mission. Awesome. For sure. No, it's a great organization. I'm, I'm happy to, you know, tag along with Danny and Kyle, um, you know, anytime well, we can. You got to take some credit, man, because you were part of this brainchild of doing this because we were together talking about all this stuff while it was kind of unfolding, you know, and yeah. this has been a couple years in the making of, you know, what else we can do. We proof of concept an event in Sierra Ancha with Caleb and trying yeah. to figure out like what we could do, what we could do to give back. Right. Yeah. Well, we need to continue being a service. Uh, so, you know, I know Danny very well and our listeners don't know him at all. Um, and if you Google him, you're going to find out a lot about his surfing um, and his professional life. But Danny has a heart of gold, not just Danny, his family, his wife, his kids, his, his in-laws, his, like all of them, you know, his whole core community. And it's I think it's ingrained in him, um, you know, just like it is in a soldier or a police officer to give back and make our community better. Um, and he's doing it there in Huntington Beach, and he's done it in other places as well. So, um, Danny, man, loved having you on today, um, talking about training. Uh, hopefully our listeners can sit there and understand kind of why we had you took a little bit of a different twist with a professional athlete uh, and a coach and tie that, you know, the same. The basics are the basics. You know, the blocking and tackling is the same uh, everywhere you go. It's just how do you apply them uh, to your profession? So. Danny, uh, thanks a lot uh, for coming yeah, on and, and spending a ton of time with us. We'll uh, go ahead and wrap it up for us. Well, yeah, we thanks a lot, Danny. If you want, uh, what's the website we can uh, find you at at Operation Open Water? Yep, operationopenwater.org. So right now we are uh, in the process of launching everything. And so Veterans Day will be our official launch which will be our one year anniversary of our channel crossing. And so our website will go live. All of our programs will be up there and you can follow us on social media, Instagram, operation open water. Awesome. Uh, yeah. 
Yeah, so if you get anybody wants to uh, check that out, donate, volunteer, whatever, that'll have all the information there for you. Uh, we have launched our YouTube channel a couple weeks ago. It's start, starting to get more traction, so you can always go to YouTube. Just search Security Matters with the Coffee Squad. Give us a subscribe and go ahead and like. Let us know what's going on. Comment. Um, you can listen to and subscribe to us at coffeesquadpodcast.com or search Security Matters with the Coffee Squad on your favorite podcast platform. We're on 15 or 16 now, so... We're starting to branch out a little bit more there. Also, give us a like and follow on Facebook at the Coffee Squad Podcast and on Instagram at security underscore matters underscore podcast. Leave a comment, share with other like-minded individuals. We always like to hear from you. So, uh, yeah, thanks for everything. Danny, it was great talking to you. Yeah, thank you, guys. Awesome, guys. Thank you. Have a good one. All right, thanks for thanks. everyone listening. Cool. Next week.